Good afternoon, everyone, and, wel and welcome to the. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the ABD seminar series. Ah, ahora. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the ABD seminar series. Before I introduce the speaker. Oh, wait. Sorry, I, before I introduce the speaker, just a couple of reminders. If you have questions, you can write them in the chat. Uh, if you want, uh, need, um, how you say, if you need a, a attendance certificates, please write them, write your name down in the chat as well, or se and then send an email to seminar AVDs. And with that, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Ikeri Rizari. He's a postdoc researcher at the University of Göttingen. And I really like his Twitter handle to summary his research. He says that he is digging genomes to travel back in time. So with that, I would like to, Iker, you can uh, start when you want to. Yeah. Thank you, Mari, for the nice introduction. and. Um for inviting me to these uh, seminars in the um, EDB. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, although uh, there is no need to say that it would have been much nicer to be uh, in person in, uh, in Sevilla and meet you all and hopefully go for some beers and tapas. But uh, yeah, maybe next year. <laughs> Um, I wanted to present a bit of my current and previous uh, work on phylogenomics and major evolutionary transitions. And let's start from the beginning, from this primordial soup, maybe this RNA world happening around 4,000 million years ago. And since then, uh, life has been uh, evolving, but um, this uh, process was uh, was not homogeneous. We can see some po points in this uh, in this evolutionary history that had um, that supposed a huge uh, change in uh, organization or in the evolutionary his history itself. So, for example, big um, uh, big moments in evolution were, of course, the evolution of the first uh, cells, and then the uh, possibility of making symbiosis. Uh, so producing food through the uh, use of uh, uh, light from the sun. And this uh, created this uh, great oxygenation event that changed, uh, so it accumulated uh, the oxygen accumulated in the atmosphere and this led to what is known the great oxygenation event that changed the fate of life on earth since. Then um, we have the appearance of the first eukaryotes and then uh, uh, through symbiosis, uh, it's also a very important uh, process of creating uh, novelty in uh, eukaryotes. And then independently, different eukaryotes, they also evolve uh, the possibility of uh, having di different tissues with different functions. And a bit later, we have, for example, the conquest of land by, uh, by plants and fungi. So the creating of the first soil, and this gave uh, rise to the um, to the flora that we see today and much more that is extinct. And then once the soil was prepared for uh, animals, then uh, some animals also crawl on plant and then also birds started to fly and uh, also dinosaurs before, fly, uh, before birds. And so um, there is no uh, general definition for major evolutionary transitions, but I think we could consider them in one of these uh, three categories. So <clears throat> I would say that uh, one of these major transitions is, uh, is one that uh, supposes a change in the organization of the organisms. So this could be, for example, symbiosis, or it could be also a multicellularity. So this, um, process by which cells, they learn to communicate with each other, and then they produce a multicellular or, uh, organism that has different tissues specialized in different uh, organs. Then we could also talk about the building blocks of uh, an organism, so the evolution of the bauplanet, and perhaps the most famous example is the Cambrian explosion, where uh, many different um, uh, animal phyla, they suddenly appeared in the fossil record. And lastly, we have these habitat transitions uh, of 
all habitat transitions, the terrestrialization event, that is the change from the aquatic environment to a terrestrial environment, is one of the most drastic uh, changes uh, in evolution. So we have to think that the, uh, the environment in the aquatic uh, in, in water is much more stable than it is outside. And so organisms are um, subjected to uh, many different kinds of stresses once they go into land and they need to adapt to all these different uh, stresses. We will talk a bit about that later. And in this uh, moment, in these major transitions in evolution, what we see is that there are many key innovations appearing and selected for, and then uh, this um, uh, given um, uh, the appropriate conditions, they often also give rise to an increased diversification uh, rate. So uh, for this reason, these major evolutionary transitions, they are very interesting moments in evolution and also very good models for studying the generation uh, of, uh, of biodiversity. But exactly for this same reason that uh, um, diversification is, uh, is um, accelerated, we also find that the underlying evolutionary relationships are more difficult to reconstruct. This is because, um, because of these fast, fast uh, radiations, they leave very few traces in the genome to, in order to build uh, the phylogeny, but also uh, they are often very ancient. So then subsequent changes, they sort of erase the, uh, the few changes that uh, happen in the genome. No? So um, this often leads us to problems on uh, building uh, the phylogeny behind these big transitions. Yet this phylogeny is key in order to understand the transitions because uh, since in evolution, we are in most cases not able to make experiments uh, on the lab, then we need to rely on the comparative approach in order to uh, go back in time and reconstruct the hypothetical ancestors. And this comparative approach requires that it is done in a robust phylogenetic framework, otherwise it has uh, no sense. One of the um, mechanisms uh, by which uh, evolution produces novelty is symbiosis. I think it's one of the most uh, amazing uh, mechanisms in evolution because by, <coughs> uh, by, uh, two or, um, by putting together two organisms, two or more organisms, we can get new emerging properties that the individual uh, units didn't have. So perhaps the archetypical example of symbiosis is uh, the origin of eukaryotes and how they acquire slowly um, uh, the organelles, mitochondria and uh, cyanobacteria from uh, symbiosis with alpha protobacteria and cyanobacteria respectively. So perhaps uh, the first eukaryotes, they started to engulf these uh, organisms as food sources, but then slowly they started to uh, to communicate with them, maybe so to exchange some metaboli metabolites. And so uh, um, then it became the process of, uh, of symbiosis where these uh, symbiotes, they slowly became uh, tamed by the nucleus. And this, is, this happened by a process known as endosymbiotic gene transfer where the uh, genetic material of the mitochondria and the plastids uh, in grand part, they passed into the nucleus. So that's the way the nucleus controls the function of these uh, organelles. And then they became part of the, of the eukaryotic cell. Another very cool example is uh, mycorrhiza. I think they are <clears throat> very often overlooked because when we look around, we see plants, but we never see, we never think of mycorrhiza, but they are actually key in allowing plants to uh, absorb enough, enough nutrients. So. Uh, most of the plants, they would live much worse without this um, symbiotic fungi. And uh, many of them, they would even not be able to live. We have um, uh, traces of um, su suggestive of the presence of mycorrhiza already in this 400 million year fossil, which uh, uh, suggests that these mycorrhiza were also involved in these terrestrialization events uh, of plants. So they were key in allowing plants to um, 
conquer the uh, land environment. <clears throat> but uh, I would like to talk about um, this work that uh, I have been uh, doing mostly in, um, in Uppsala University about the origin of plastics, that is the acquisition of the photosynthetic activity by eukaryotes. So if you think about it, I, I said before that uh, photosynthesis first appeared in bacteria, right? And then there was the origin of eukaryotes. And at some point, uh, some eukaryotes, they acquired the ability to photosynthesize. This means a huge change in their lifestyle. So you pass from being, from <clears throat> being a heterotroph of eating things that are around to being autotroph. It means you are able to produce food with a little bit of sunlight and not many more. So this gives a huge advantage, uh, advantage over the other images. And in fact, uh, we see uh, the advantage of plastids uh, being very big because these have been uh, spread through the eukaryotic tree of life many times. So uh, according to the traditional hypothesis, there was a single endosymbiotic event, I can show it here, in the ancestor of what we call archaeplasty, that they are three lineages, the red algae, the glaucophytes and the green algae plus lamp plants that uh, have plastids derived directly from cyanobacteria. These are called the uh, archaeoplastida. And then subsequently, there were secondary eukaryote to eukaryotic uh, symbiosis that spread the ability to photosynthesize to many different organisms. Actually, the eukaryotic tree of life is full of uh, photosynthetic uh, things that are not, uh, not do not belong in archaeoplastida. For example, the uh, algae that you eat with nori belongs to straminopides here. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so if we represent this traditional hypothesis in this phylogeny, for example, we could show uh, the phylogeny of the nucleus, that is of the host of this symbiosis in gray, and we could show the phylogeny of uh, the plastid in green. And so we have a single event here of endosymbiosis where uh, you, uh, the first, uh, the, so the archaeoplastid ancestor, it would um, engulf this plastid and then make it uh, part of the cell. And then we have the vertical uh, transmission of the plastid uh, together with the nuclear uh, genome. And actually this, uh, this uh, hypothesis is supported when uh, we do a phylogenetic analysis with plastids. So we have a strong support here of the three lineages of archaeoplastida being monophyletic when we compare them with a bunch of cyanobacteria. So it seems that there is no doubt. However, when uh, people have been trying to build the phylogeny of the nuclear genome, uh, the story is, uh, as usual, more complicated. Actually, uh, existing uh, phylogenomic data sets, they do not recover the monophyly of archaeoplastida in most cases. And, uh, and also they fail to arrive to an alternative uh, consistent conclusion. So they are essentially a lot of different phylogenies uh, based on nu uh, nuclear uh, genomes that, uh, yeah, they raise some questions regarding the origin of plastids. But why do I say this? Why is it important that we uh, also resolve the monophyly of the host of the nucleus? isn't enough to use maybe the, the plastic and then uh, maybe think that the nucleus, maybe we don't have enough information. Well, actually, uh, this traditional hypothesis is one of four possible uh, alternatives that um, uh, in having the mon uh, monophyletic plastids. But of these four possible hypotheses, three of them do not require that the host, the nuclear genomes, are mono, monophyletic. So they do not require that archaeoplastida, these three lineages of archaeoplastida, are monophyletic from the host point of view. And this can be, for example, a secondary loss in one of the lineages that is not uh, photosynthetic nowadays, or it could be a serial endosymbiotic event where one of the lineages acquires the plastid from the uh, from the cyanobacteria, and then there is a secondary eukaryotic to eukaryotic uh, um, symbiosis where the two other lineages, they acquire it from the first uh, photosynthetic um, um, uh, eukaryote. 
Or the third hypothesis that is the one that I like most is where you would have independent endosymbiosis from close related cyanobacterial lineages. So you can imagine here that two close related cyanobacterial lineages can be engulfed here, for example, in rhodophytes and uh, chloroplastica here. And uh, another lineage could be uh, acquired by these uh, glaucophytes. Uh, the true lineages of Archaeoplastida. And especially if these um, if these cyanobacteria are extinct today, when we build the phylogeny of the plastid, we would not be able to uh, to identify these two independent uh, um, symbiosis, but we would recover the monophyly of plastids. So as you see, they are different evolutionary scenarios that can explain the monophyly of the plastid without requiring uh, the monophyly of the host of the nucleus. And so this has been a long-standing question in the phylogeny of eukaryotes. Uh, it's probably one of the most uh, pressing uh, questions uh, nowadays. And th this is again, because it is a fast radiation uh, and there is a low signal to noise, noise ratio in the sense that there is a lot of non-phylogenetic information in the data that is um, is making it difficult to reconstruct this, uh, this uh, um, the true phylogenetic uh, information. So in order to uh, resolve this, I took the following approach. I first wanted to learn what happened in previous uh, works. And so I started with, uh, um, with four uh, phylogenomic data sets that had been published uh, re um, relatively recently. And then I tried to reanalyze them in a way to understand what was happening in those four data sets. So as you can see, three of them, so they recover different eukaryotic relationships, but most importantly, Archeplastida in green, they are recovered in different uh, affiliations. So we, the important thing to look here is that three of them they identify at least two lineages of Archeplastida. So they are not monophyletic. These are all nuclear phylogenies. The, four, um, the fourth um, data set instead recovers a strong monophyly of uh, Archeplastida. And this is already uh, quite uh, surprising. So the first thing that I did to understand what was happening is to study uh, the sampling of genes and of species. So this is one key uh, element in phylogenomics or phylogenetics in general, <clears throat> uh, that depending which genes and which species you choose to represent, then you tend to get different phylogenetic relationships. Uh, and making a long story short, because maybe this is not so uh, important, I didn't see that this explained uh, the differences. So essentially, by subsampling comparable sets of genes and taxa, I try to see if those genes would be, if, the, if those phylogenies would be more similar to each other, but actually they are not. So this is not explaining uh, the differences we see in the in the trees. So then I went and I tried to understand what was the um, contribution of each gene to supporting the monophyly or the non-monophyly of these Archeplastida lineages. And as you can see here, one of the uh, data sets has, has a few genes with a disproportionate uh, um, uh, support for the monophyly of Archeplastida, shown in green. And this is quite different compared to the other three data set and also compared to the genes that support relationships that are not the monophyly of this uh, Archeplastida. And actually, when one looks at those genes, I found that in this data set, they, um, they include plastid and uh, sometimes mitochondrial paralogs together with the nuclear genes. So they didn't do a good cleaning step in the, in the process of building the data set. And this was, uh, this was very clear because uh, I added plastid and nuclear um, paralogs from known uh, genomes, for example, uh, Arabidopsis, and, uh, and then clearly they cluster in the different um, in the different clades here. So after confirming this, I remove those contaminants and paralogs only of the um, eight genes that were most uh, uh, the most uh, stronger uh, strongest outliers in this data set and after removing those paralogs and contaminants, Actually, uh, 
uh, if you reanalyze the data set, you lose this monophyly of archeplastid as shown uh, in the original paper, which means that uh, we end up with essentially four data sets with different relationships uh, between the different uh, yeah, archeplastid lineages, but we end up with essentially no answer. So uh, in a second step, I try to address this question by increasing the signal by combining all four data sets. So I combine all four data sets, looking for a, a partially overlapping genes and taxa in, the, in, in those data sets, and then I fill in the gaps with available data. And actually, after a long process of cleaning the data set for paralogs, contaminants, and then using also a complex uh, phylogenetic uh, mixture models, we were able to recover the monophyly of the archeplastida here. So um, the conclusions are that to resolve archeplastida, we needed not only larger data sets, but especially cleaner data sets. One needed to be very careful about having very, cl uh, very uh, clean data sets in order to be able to, re uh, to recover this true phylogenetic signal. And this, of course, also requ uh, require the use of complex phylogenetic uh, models. Using simpler ones, uh, we were not able to do that. And from a biological perspective, uh, this uh, monophyly of archeplastida uh, is congruent uh, for the first time between the plastid and the nucleus. And this means that this, uh, this scenario is most uh, easily explained by a single endosymbiotic event in the ancestor of archeplastida. So we can, um, if we can tease apart uh, the four uh, different scenarios that I showed before. So um, I cannot, I don't have time to go much in detail about this, but I invite you to look at our preprint. There is also some interesting uh, results uh, for people working on phylogenomics regarding alignment trimming. And I would also invite you, if you are interested in, in these topics, in uh, looking at this uh, second uh, uh, preprint on the evolution of secondary uh, plastids derived from red algae. They have a very crazy history. They move around a lot, and there is a lot of controversy uh, around them. So it's really interesting. Uh, but I want now to follow on the line of the evolution of archeplastida. And as I mentioned before, then uh, there was the origin of uh, multicellularity independently in red algae and in green algae, and finally in land plants that have the most complexity in the different tissues. But we don't have to forget that also multicellularity appeared multiple times independently in the eukaryotic uh, tree. So we have, for example, the slime molds here, we have fungi, we have metazoans, and we have also some straminopites, like uh, it would be the kelp, for example. And once uh, plants became multicellular, and they were able to do more complex things, and then around 600 million years, they conquered land which was quite stressful. And here comes my uh, explanation of my current work in the University of Göttingen in the lab led by Jan de Fries. And um, so around 600 million years, we had a diversity of different algae and then some lineage decided to crawl, crawl on land. And then we had this sort of like algae living there that evolved some um, some uh, stems and then some, um, uh, some roots, and eventually giving rise to the uh, last common ancestor of land plants here uh, that would give rise to uh, here mosses, bryophytes, and vascular plants. So in this process that it looks, might look rather uh, unglamorous, it's actually quite cool. I think it was a quite epic moment in evolution because if you think how different it is to live as an algae in the in, in water and then what it is to be a plant on land, there are a lot of changes that you have to uh, to uh, to adapt to. So we have on the first hand uh, you have to protect you need protection from drought, uh, also very drastic conditions uh, changes in temperature, and also you have to change the osmosis in order to protect from uh, salinity stress. 
And then, of course, you have much stronger light and UV light, so you need protection against this uh, against the sun. So there is a lot of uh, a lot of things that uh, this poor algae had to uh, learn to adapt to during this uh, process. Uh, if we look at, at the phylogeny of um, of this uh, process, it was again a difficult phylogeny to resolve. Uh, I was not involved on this, so but now it seems that we have a fairly uh, well resolved phylogeny, where we have here the crophytes. Recently, there has been a, a description on a, of a new phylum here, uh, branching earlier. But what we care about is about this lineage of streptophytes. And streptophytes include these six lineages, like phenum level uh, lineages of algae and land plants. So uh, the transition from aquatic environment to the terrestrial environment is not so linear as I portrayed it before. Actually, this, um, this um, algae here, they, have, uh, they are very diverse. They have very different lifestyles, very different levels of um, of multicellularity, some they are uh, unicellular, some form some filament, or uh, even uh, uh, differential tissues, like for example, cara here. And they have very different uh, lifestyles. Some are fully aquatic, some they are semi-terrestrial, and some live fully uh, outside of water. For example, we have some algae that live on rocks in the desert, and they seem to be happy there. Uh, yeah. So uh, our approach in, uh, in the DeFries lab is to use this comparative approach of, um, uh, of uh, streptophytes in order to understand the ancestors that gave rise to uh, uh, land plants. <clears throat> so we are interested generally in uh, understanding how was this uh, ancestor of the land plants. And this, we do it through the comparison uh, in a strict phylogenetic uh, framework of uh, this uh, of the features found in these different algae, but this requires, of course, to uh, have information about this uh, algae. In particular, we are interested in how uh, the stress response evolved in this transition from water to land in plants. Uh, for example, the changes in temperature, the changes in salinity, the uh, changes in uh, protection from sun and UV and drought. So uh, using a comparative uh, genomics, we want to um, understand how this uh, stress response pathway evolved along this uh, phylogeny. Yeah, so uh, we want to reconstruct this path to terrestrialization focusing on the, uh, on the pathway uh, of stress response. And uh, in my case, I will be studying, I'm studying the, um, the genomes, looking for differences in uh, gene families, but also the transcriptomic, transcriptomic response of different algae to different stresses. So we can grow this algae in the lab and then do experiments with them and try to uh, understand how they respond to those different stresses and then reconstructing those features into the phylogeny uh, trying to understand how uh, this uh, hypothetical uh, land plant ancestor was. So unfortunately, I cannot tell you more about this because I recently started this position in summer. So maybe next year I can tell you more, a lot of exciting things. But what I can talk about is about the conquest of land by vertebrates. This is based on some previous work of mine. And this was also a quite, so it's a quite uh, famous uh, event in evolution happening in the Devonian around 420 million years ago. And so uh, very fast uh, refreshment. Um, vertebrates, they are these guys here. So we have uh, the land vertebrates, there is the clade called Tetrapoda because we, they have four limbs and these include amphibians, mammals, and reptiles, sensulato, including also birds. <clears throat> and so this, uh, in contrast to fishes, they live mostly on land. Birds then learn to fly, right? But, and, um, and these tetrapods, they evolve from what we know as sarcopterygian fishes. So land fishes and selacans. 
Currently, there are only six species of lungfishes and two species of silicons uh, living. And they have this low fin, uh, low finch, fin, oh, sorry, this low finch, they, they look like, um, um, they are very different from uh, normal uh, right fin fish uh, uh, fins. And so they actually look more like uh, limbs. So this was one of the big changes that, uh, that tetrapods had to, um, to, to, to do in order to be able to move on land. But there were many other uh, adaptations that uh, uh, this uh, required, right? So for example, you, you can imagine that you need to learn how to breathe on earth, uh, on, breathe uh, um, on land, and then you need to change your osmosis because it's not the same to be in water than being outside, so protection from drought again and pro protection from the sun. So many different uh, adaptations that uh, tetrapods had to um, uh, overcome in this, in this process here. <clears throat> and again, uh, under this uh, major evolutionary transition, the phylogeny was um, dubious. And actually there are three possible uh, uh, hypotheses for the relationship between tetrapods here shown by the frog the lungfish and uh, the celacant. And in a previous work, we show that uh, lungfishes are the closest li uh, living relatives of tetrapods. And we were able to um, uh, reject the other two possible alternatives uh, due to the, uh, so we, we show that uh, these alternatives were the, produ the product of systematic error. So now systematic error in phylogenomics is um, what happens when uh, there is this mismatch between your data and the model that you use to model your data. So molecular evolution is very complex and our models are in general quite simplistic. So when we use, when you use few genes, this mismatch between your data and the model is not that big. So uh, then systematic error might not be so problematic. But in phylogenomics, we are talking that we uh, put together hundreds or even thousands of genes and so by putting all these genes together, what we do is we amplify this small error that we would find in one single gene. And this can lead to systematic error in our um, analysis. So if we do a parallelism, for example, with, uh, with a distribution, uh, the key of a systematic error is to differentiate between precision and accuracy. So the precision would be how narrow the distribution is. And uh, that's exactly what phylogenomic does. By including many uh, a lot of genes, we can reduce the uncertainty in the, in, the, in the data, and we can create very narrow distributions. But then another question is whether this distribution is close to the real uh, tree or not, and that is accuracy. And for example, here we have a mean that is, is quite far away from the true mean, but is very precise, right? So what we want is to have not only very precise phylogenetic estimates, but we want also to have accurate estimates. And how do we do this? So the way we do this is to uh, tweak the data set in different ways uh, to, for example, test the for the presence of systematic error. We uh, change the data set in ways that we amplify or we reduce the systematic error. And this allows us to understand whether the, our tree is, the, is suffering from the systematic error or not. And of course, using uh, more complex models that can uh, recover the complex signal uh, in the data set. So here again, we used a different approach uh, using mostly RNA-seq data from a hundred species. And we built this big data set of 7,000 genes. And we again recover the, the position of lungfishes as being sister group to tetrapods. But uh, taking advantage of this analysis, we also uh, clarify some previous questions that somehow remained in the phylogeny of vertebrates. And this include the monophyly of uh, amphibians and also the internal relationships between the big lineages, that is frogs, uh, salamanders, and Sicilians. And also uh, the sister group relationship of turtles to Arcosauria. Arcosauria would include the crocodiles and, 
and birds. So these points in the phylogeny, they have been very much uh, discussed because uh, um, it's, it's, it's also interesting to see that in these uh, in this, um, controversial uh, branches in the tree of life, there are also big changes in the morphology, right? So I don't know if this would be considered major transitions, but we can see that the body plants, they are uh, fairly different between these branches. So I think it's an interesting uh, observation. So once we have uh, the phylogeny of vertebrates uh, clarified and is robust enough, then we can start to add, uh, ask uh, interesting biologically uh, interesting questions. Like for example, perhaps the most uh, famous um, adaptations that uh, vertebrates uh, acquire to go to land was the, were the limbs, the hands, fingers, right? And this was very nicely uh, shown by Neil Shubin in Uriner Fish. And is this change between the low, low fin, fins in, in these uh, guys, well, actually in ancestor, to the tetrapod limb. And here I wanted to briefly mention uh, this work that we, had, we have published uh, recently, where we study the um, expression of hox genes in the uh, lungfish embryos. So um, here, uh, so what we saw is that uh, the hox A13 gene, what, that is responsible for, uh, is marking the presence of the hand, in uh, tetrapods is also similarly expressed in lungfish. While HOXD13, this gene, uh, it's expressed differently in lungfish and tetrapods. So in tetrapods, the archetypical situation is where you have um, uh, HOXD13 and it starts to be expressed in the pinky, so in the small uh, finger. And then during development, uh, this um, gene uh, is expressed uh, towards the thumb. It's also very interesting that in tetrapods, so our thumb has a different developmental program than all other uh, four uh, fingers. But in lungfish, interestingly, this dynamic uh, expression of HOXD13 does not happen during evolution, so, uh, so sorry, during uh, development. So this stays, it grows, but it doesn't move uh, dynamically towards the um, um, the frontal part of the of the fin. So what does it tell the, uh, what, what does this tell us? So we can see that this suggests that in the ancestor of lungfishes and tetrapods, there was already probably a primitive hand shown by the expression of Hox 13 but the fingers that are, um, are generated by this dynamic expression of Hox 13 is a true innovation of uh, tetrapods. So this clarifies uh, this transition between the fins of fishes and the uh, hands of, tetra of tetrapods. So as a conclusion of this uh, last part, I show uh, this big data set that we, um, that we built uh, to uh, reconstruct the phylogeny of vertebrates. But together with this, we also propose a pipeline to assemble uh, large and consistent phylogenomic data sets. From a phylogenetic point of view, we show that lungfishes, again, are the, tetra, are the sister group of tetrapods, and we were able to reject uh, the two other possible alternatives. Using this phylogeny, we also uh, study, so we use also this phylogeny to study, put into context the uh, gene expression uh, in the uh, fin to limb transition. So we learned that in, lamp, in the ancestor of lampfishes and tetrapods, there was a primitive hand. And then uh, subsequently, only in tetrapods, there was the evolution of uh, fingers. And to conclude, I would like to uh, wrap up by uh, reminding you um, um, that major transitions in evolution, they are really cool moments. They are amazing moments. And I hope I convince uh, convince you a bit of this. They are also excellent models to study the processes and patterns in evolution. Uh, the way we do this normally is through comparative uh, analysis, but this requires a um, phylogenetic framework that is robust. If we are using the wrong phylogeny, then our uh, inferences will be totally off. But as I mentioned in all three, uh, or in all these three cases that I presented, the phylogeny is often blurry. It's difficult to reconstruct. 
And the way we do this is by having not only more data, but especially better data. We need to be very careful on the data, and then we need to use complex models in order to build those uh, phylogenies. And when we have the phylogeny, we can use comparative omics data or Ibodivo or other kinds of information sources in order to understand uh, these uh, changes that happen in this during these uh, major evolutionary transitions. And with this, I would like to thank my supervisors and collaborators and the funding agencies. And if you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Iker, for a wonderful talk. Uh, we are now going to activate the chat in YouTube so you can write down your questions or ask for the seminars. Uh, uh, attendance certificates. Uh, meanwhile, while we activate the chat, I'm going to ask Iker uh, a couple of questions. <gasps> so um, one of the questions that I have regards just the last part of your talk, uh, when you were talking about the Ivo Divo and the uh, using transcriptomics to analyze the hoc scenes. So I was wondering, I didn't, I didn't really catch that. So you were doing uh, transcriptomics that were like uh, tissue specific, so you could actually know how they were progressing from mm -hmm. uh, the thing uh, through the fingers. I don't know if you can show the slide where we were. Yeah, sorry, that was a bit fast. But so uh, what we did, I mean, we study uh, in this case we study the lungfish. So what is known of uh, of uh, tetrapods or, for example, mice. Uh, this is based on previous work. So people have been uh, studying this. Uh, for a lot of time. But the cool thing of this study is that we were able to use uh, lungfish embryos uh, to do RNA-seq. So we did RNA-seq of, of different parts of the fin. But then we also did this uh, in situ hybridization yeah. of the probes with uh, of these genes. So the, actually the, um, the expression patterns, they are mostly based on the in situ hybridization. Oh. Yeah, so we have also rna seq data, but uh, then the rna seq data, they are always a bit more complicated because it's difficult to cut spe specifically on one region or... Yeah, I was wondering because there are now these new techniques that are like tissue specific rna seq and you can actually mm -hmm. place the rna seq uh, according to a place of a cell in a single <laughs> area or single cell transcriptomics, so that's why I was wondering about where was the yeah, so technique. The limitation of these lungfishes is that uh, having uh, so having access to those um, to those lungfishes was very difficult. So these were some embryos that they were stored in okay. RNA later for many years okay. in the minus 80. So it's not uh, so easy to have them in uh, in the aquarium and then have a lot a lot of eggs, and then it's not so easy to work with them as other organisms. Yeah. So then uh, also the things that you can do with them, they are somehow limited by the, by the model itself. Um, but at the same time, it's a very interesting model because it has a key phylogenetic position that no other model can uh, answer. answer to those questions. No? Mm -hmm. yeah. Very interesting. So I'm going to see if in the chat, we we are we have been able to activate the Marie, Marie sorry I think um, that the chat is not working yet. Oh, okay. I think I think we need to stop the the, the video for a second. If okay. I'm not wrong. So mm -hmm. uh, August, do you want to stop the video? Yeah, we are having some problems. I'm sorry. So we don't have um, uh, questions from the audience, but I was also um, going to ask you a very, very general question. Okay. So you said before that some stressors could be like um, triggers of fast evolution in in a species. And do you think that this, this is a like very, I don't know, very speculative question, but do you think that this climate change we are currently experiencing do you think it could be like a stressor for having like a fast evolution for adapting to it 
for instance? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's uh, it's very interesting. Um, I, so actually, my view is that it's not the stressors that they promote uh, mm. for the change, but is it would be more like uh, the the organisms they try to adapt to those changes. But I think here the difference between the historical patterns that we see and the climate, climate change is the, the problem of the temporal scale. And I mean, in biology, everything is possible. I don't know. It's difficult to say <laughs> that something will not happen. But I would tend to think that most of the species, they are not able to adapt fast enough to those changes. They are way too fast. Um, a bit similarly to what happened before in the great extinctions. So they mm -hmm. are drastic uh, changes in the environmental conditions that then they sort of made uh, most species to disappear, no? But I don't know, maybe cockroaches or so, they will survive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is also the thing I, we always believe, no? That evolution is really time taking. But there are some results that are like it's tricky and like some very fast responses to. Oh, it, it's, it's totally possible. And I don't know. It's yeah, <laughs> we don't know it really. So I, I think the, the chat is still. Um... No, if so, uh, yes, if you guys update the, uh, the, the link in YouTube, it should chart. So if you just like click update. Oh, okay. The mm -hmm. chat is working. So for everyone that wants to talk in the chat, if you guys update the chat, it should be working. So maybe Mari, do you want to not do another question while we wait a little bit? Uh, well, yes, I have a, well, more than a question is like a worry. When I was looking at the precision versus accuracy, uh, it was the precision the graph that you saw, uh, yeah, the graph that shows the precision versus accuracy, yeah. that one. Yeah, it's kind of far from the true distance. So uh, I don't know to what extent it is normal to actually check for systematic error in studies or, or not. These people well, aware that when you see genomes, we are, going to be, we are going to be introducing so much error or um, yeah that's yeah that, that's my favorite topic but uh, <laughs> okay no, um, actually so this distribution i don't know if it was maybe it was not clear but uh, this distribution is has nothing to do with my tree or with any tree it's just to show this parallelism between precision and accuracy okay so this true distance uh, has nothing to do with any tree that i show it's just a way to show that precision doesn't need to be uh, accurate so you can have very precise but not accurate measurements, but you can also have precise and accurate. That would be uh, the, the uh, situation where the true distance is here, right? Um, <clears throat> but uh, so yes, I think in, in phylogenomic uh, analysis, uh, people do test for the presence of systematic error. Uh, there are different things that you can do. So. The different people do different, uh, use different strategies. But yeah, it's something that normally people do, especially when the underlying relationships, they are complex or they suspect it to be a bit controversial or you find something weird, then very often uh, people do that and then reviewers more and more ask for this. And I think it's important because it's important to remember that having more genes doesn't give us necessarily the the real answer. It only gives us more precision, but we also need to make sure that this precision is so our estimate is also accurate. And this you have to do it uh, tweaking a bit the data set. I mean, of course, it's never possible to know the truth, no? because we are looking at the history. And so evolution is a historical science, but you can at least discard the presence of a systematic error. There is also a new um, study quite interesting that they actually use uh, simulations and they simulate data according to different scenarios, for example, where you would expect to have a systematic error. 
And then um, that's also another way where you could test uh, the presence of systematic error by comparing your trees with the simulated trees under the different conditions that you use to analyze it. I think. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for that explanation. I don't know if we have uh, more questions. Not, not really, not yet. But I think because we have this delay with the, with the, with the YouTube uh, chat. Sorry, we always have some problems. <laughs> Sorry for the attend attendees and for you. But please, if you have any question, uh, we will can we can wait a little, a, a few minutes for for having your questions. Yeah, there is a question by Chris Litke. He says, if there is any danger that the data set cleaning ends, ends up in, a, in, in, in having a bias for your findings. Um, well, I mean, I guess it depends how you do this cleaning, no? <laughs> um, so in principle, um, the cleaning should not bias your data set because your data set is biased from the beginning. So what you are actually trying is to remove this bias. Then uh, it's important when you do this also to not do it in a way that you are forcing the, the data set to give you the, the result that you want because yeah, that would be a trick, no? But there are clear things that are wrong in the data set and you can remove those. For example, I showed in the beginning uh, this presence of parallax. So these are the kinds of things that people should, sorry, oops, oops. These are the kinds of things that are not acceptable in, in a phylogenomic uh, data set because here you are biasing the data. So you have to use some kind of criteria to decide what is a good sequence and what is a contamination or a parallel or something. So they are, um, it's also true that there is no a single magical solution for this. So it's in general, a bit of arts and crafts, uh, but they are some automatic and semi-automatic tools that, uh, that people uh, can use for this, for example, to select orthologs. And then, yeah. But in, in my opinion, there is nothing like having a look to a few gene trees and a bit uh, looking at the alignments because this tells you a lot. Uh, when you are working with thousands of genes, there is also the risk of just looking at the black screen and then doing comments, but not looking at the actual data. And I think looking at the actual data tells you a lot. Not that you have to then manually clean them all. Um, that's quite painful because I can tell you I have done this, for example, for this analysis, but uh, I don't think you need to do this uh, specifically. But looking at the data allows you to identify what the problems are and then trying to uh, take specific steps to remove uh, those problems. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> so any more questions in the, from the audience? I, I think nobody asked anything else. Mm -hmm. Do you want to ask anything else, uh, Mari? Uh, no, I think... Uh... These were most of my questions. I can I can say that there will be some exciting news regarding the last part of my talk of the uh, Thursday session on vertebrates happening soon. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, I could not show them today. But stay tuned. Um, okay. Well, I'll stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a nature going soon or something like that. <laughs> I mean, it's a very interesting topic. So. I mean. And next year you um, you can invite me in person and then I will talk, tell you. Talk about <laughs> yeah, it. sure. No, you worry. We are looking <laughs> forward. <laughs> we are looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry. There is a last question by Teresa Boquete. Um, she says that she enjoyed very much talk and she really hopes that you can come back next year with uh, more data on the plant terrestrialization project. And which models are you using for that project? Elgi and, and bryophytes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the nice words. Uh, here, so in Göttingen, we are um, specifically using 
we are focusing on this streptophyte algae. So they are all the lineages except the land plants. There is <clears throat> already a lot of uh, data and a lot of people working in land plants, also in bryophytes. A lot of people trying to understand the stress response also in, um, in, in those um, bryophytes. And yeah, but what we focus is on the, on the algae, so in this ancestor uh, here. But of course, using available data, the data that are being generated from uh, land plants. Yeah, comparatively, there are um, fewer people looking at the algae than to land plants. Okay, thank you. So I think that's all. Thank you so much, Iker. Yeah, thank you to you. It was a pleasure. <laughs>